Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Weekly Politics Show. I'm Councillor Purimir with co-host uh, Councillor Andrew Ritter. In this section, we're going to discuss what happens next, what happens after the referendum. Um, you, we're going to have the result one way or another on Saturday. Is it yes for mayor or no? I, or number two or no uh, for leading cabinet. Uh, so what happens next? So, Andrew, do you want to uh, talk through? Are you going to be there at the count just for just out of interest? So do you want to just talk through what what the timetable and what 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 happens in the weekend, and then what do you think is going to happen straight after that, so to speak? Yeah. So um, the count begins tomorrow morning at the Excel Centre from about seven thirty onwards uh, in the morning. So what they'll basically be doing is sort of emptying all of the sort of the ballot boxes uh, from each of the polling stations, making sure that none of the ballot papers went into the wrong box, which is why everything has to be counted on the same day. But my understanding is that separate teams will do the Mayor of London votes, uh, a separate team will do the mail referendum, and then a separate team will do the Isle of Dogs neighbourhood planning referendum, which is what I'm, I'm there to observe. Uh, but I might be able to sort of go over and, and have a look at the other one. So in terms of timing, we we just don't know. It might be really quick because it's very simple. You know, basically, it's a yes or no. So it's not like really complicated like the London Merrill one is going to be with, if you remember seeing your ballot paper, lots and lots of different boxes. So the, the count actually may be very quick tomorrow. Um, and I'll tweet about the results as, as soon as we we hear them. But I think once we know the results, I think everybody's going to have to have a you know deep think about what we do for the next year. If the Merrill system wins, um, I suspect there may be a lot of interest uh, within Tower Hamlets Council about making sure the mayor doesn't have too much power. Um, so we may have a big rewrite of the constitution and sort of change practices. I mean, the mayor can overturn some of that um, you know, because the mayor. That's the whole point. The mayor has lots of power. But it's harder to overturn established practice in the constitution than, than if there is nothing in, in place. Whereas if the leader system wins, um, there's still a lot of unresolved detail about how the leader actually works. You know, I can understand that they're elected for a four year term. Um, but then how do cabinet members get appointed? You know, my understanding is that the leader picks the cabinet members and then decides whether they have a vote or not. Um, and that's something, again, we may want to try and influence uh, to make sure that cabinet members have, have the right to, to vote in the leader system. So, again, there's, there'll be a lot of work um, within the council uh, on things like the constitution and, and how decisions are made by the cabinet, depending on, on which side wins tomorrow. But, but in terms of changing the constitution, we could only change it at the AGM or do, would we have to call an, an extraordinary meeting at the council to change it uh, that's that's my understanding that when it comes to constitutions it's only at the agm you could table a change to a constitution have you thought have you thought about the mechanisms of that or have you um, i thought we could change it because i know that we're making other you know minor incremental changes mm. um you know, so sort of tightening up the wording and, and other areas. So I thought we could do this at ordinary council meetings, but I'm not sure. And again, this is part of the problem is, as we've said before, this has been so rushed is, is a lot of the, the facts and how this worked was still not very clear. What, what we do know is council officers have already been thinking about some of these issues. Um, you know, so they're also getting ready for, for this as well, depending on, on which side wins. Um, this is if the leader system wins. I don't know if they're thinking about what happens if the mayoral system um, wins. But yeah, there'll have to be a lot of sort of thought about how it works. And we'll have to do some research about how does the leader system work elsewhere or, or how can you, whether it's legally possible or not, I, I don't know, to constrain um, a mayor before they're even elected. So, well, Yeah, the, it'll, be, it'll, be it'll be interesting um, to actually do that. You've been reading... Uh, just say on the weekend the mail system does win obviously the discussion is going to be as to how can we have proper checks and balances to mm -hmm. make sure that we don't have the issues that we've had in the past yeah. you've been reading all the commissioner reports say in liverpool um croydon was a different system but again croydon can happen um have you had any I thoughts and ideas as to what kind of extra checks and balances that we can have on an executive 
Merrill model? Um, so, so there are a couple of examples. So one area we know is that Avian Scrutiny Committee routinely complain about we just don't have enough officer resource. And that's not me saying that. There's actually other Labour councillors who are kind of saying that. And, you know, we've only got, you know, one or two officers kind of dedicated. So one of the arguments might be is you might want to beef up the over in, over in scrutiny committee and, and appoint some extra officers and put them in next year's budget. So that's a really well-funded kind of organisation that has lots of officer support. That doesn't mean that a future mayor couldn't, you know, kick those people out or fire them or, or make that job really difficult and remove the officers that way. But, but if it would force the mayor to do that, and that would be a clear warning sign that if a mayor did that, then they're not interested in scrutiny and transparency. Um, so that would kind of help. And, and there are some other areas. So, for example, you know, Mayor John Biggs a few months ago said that cabinet members have the right to, to vote. Uh, obviously, he needs to continue that. And, and we kind of need to make that an established practice. So, again, if a new mayor comes in, it's like, well, this is what the previous mayor did. Of course, you're going to continue this. And if you don't, then it's a very clear signal that actually you're not intending to, to run the mayoral system. And, and we could do this as part of the election campaign. So what we could do in the election campaign is come up with some basic principles, for example, that cabinet members have the right to vote and get get the um, the candidates for mayor to actually commit to those principles in public before the election. And if they don't do that, then again, that's a signal for voters. And if they decide to break their promise, well, then they have to break their promise, but at least they've, they've made that commitment in advance. So those are the, kind of some of the things that um, I'm thinking about or, or that we need to think about collectively, both councillors, but also residents of Tower Hamlets as well. Because I'm clear, you know, I actually did vote to keep the mayoral system, but, you know, I did sort of say its main problem is that, you know, one, one person has too much power uh, and they can use that for good or they can use that for bad. I, I think the other the other power that a lot of people don't realize the executive mayor has is the power of patronage. And so I just yeah. want to explain what that means is there's all these bodies out there in Tower Hamlets. I didn't even know some of them existed um, where the mayor just appoints people onto these boards. And some of them actually make quite important decisions when you actually look at them. On some of them on a very strategic level. I think the, the Olympic Legacy Board, I don't, I don't know what they're called, they, they, that that makes really important decisions or used to make decisions, but has oversight to to say even the Whitechapel Gallery, which is a strategic anchor, um, and then the housing association. So each of the local housing associations, the Tower Hamlets Council has the right to send someone there. They they're all concentrated in the hands of a uh, a single individual, and there's no transparency. There's no transparency as to who gets appointed, what's the reasoning behind those appointments. Um, and there's there's no way of actually challenging or, or checking up on these appointments, saying, look, do these guys turn up to the meetings? What do they actually agree on? Are they what they're agreeing on? Are they in line with say the strategic agenda of the council? Um it's, it's really weird. I, I did detect a pattern where just one certain individual was in all the arts appointments. Um, that's the only pattern I could detect. I, I let the listeners uh, sort of like decide what that means. But um, what's, your, what's your views on that? How can we, in terms of appointments, have you had any ideas about that or any good practices that are out there in terms of these kind of things? Um, so generally speaking, uh, the people who, who get these are all from the Labour Party, so I have no experience of some of these <laughs> other committees. Uh, they'll, have, ha they'll have to say Councillor Peter Golds, I think, is on the Armed Forces Committee, so it's not completely clean sweep. But, but the other power of pat patronage is to give councillors jobs uh, with money attached as well. Um, and that's something else, you know, there are roughly about 30 councillors who get extra money. Um, and from memory, I might have got this slightly wrong, about just about 15 of them, um, it's in the power of the mayor to give those people jobs uh, and the other 15 are kind of, uh, they're selected by their by their fellow councillors. So the chair of the Open Scrutiny Committee is normally sort of done by, by other councillors, um, same in, with audit in, in principle as well. 
um, you know, and there's a lot of money uh, that goes with some of those jobs, you know, potentially up to £30,000 if you're a deputy mayor, on top of your council allowance of £10,000, so that's £40,000 in total, and it's a lot of money. Um, and it's the same thing that, you know, government also, you know, government give money to, to ministers as well, uh, and that's another very important power of patronage. And there's not much we can do about that, but but what we might want to do is kind of reduce the number of people who get extra money, uh, which I know is maybe something that's not universally popular among fellow councillors. But again, if you reduce the number of people, the number of paid jobs, um, again, that would force a new mayor to then have to change that, which will be more difficult than if you're inheriting something where lots of people are getting a fair amount of money. It, it, it was it's kind of interesting when you talked about the SRAs. I actually bumped into yesterday um the former deputy mayor, you know, deputy leader of Tahamas Council, Council Abdul Shakur, who was um and he basically talked about in his time where they didn't get an SRA and they found it difficult and then he went to Norway to look at the uh there and then they bought the idea of the allowances. And it seems like the discussions come back a full circle now where people are saying, hang on a minute, there's too much money swimming around. We need to get um, we need to go back to some kind of balance. Uh, but it's, it's kind of interesting, the, the full circle. We're going to go um, straight into a break. After the break, we're going to discuss what's happening nationally. So we, we've had a sort of like a real focus on Tower Hamlets. Uh, the colourful politics in kind of Tower Hamlets, but we're going to look at nationally. There's some interesting things happening. Um, probably it's a time for Andrew to gloat, kind of ish. <laughs> I see vindication of, of of a certain political uh, direction, but you know, but uh, the, but there's different interpretations. So we're going to look at Hartlepool, but we're just generally going to look at what's happening. In, uh, throughout the country, especially where you've got all these local government elections and the trends as well, and try to explain and see what the impacts are going to be in London and in Tower Hamlets from those little break. After the break, we're going to go to Hartlepool and the local elections. Great. <laughs> 